Hi, this is Jeff Sr. And you're listening to Awakened Nation with Brad Salas. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Jeff, man, it is so good to see you. Um, I have, Great to see you, Brad. It's been a while. Uh, thanks, man. Uh, our guests are just going to love you. Folks, uh, if you're just tuning in, uh, I have Jeff Sr. on the show today, and he is a pilot by day, a rock star by night, uh, but there's so much more to him. He's he's a creative, uh, I would have to say a creative genius who just takes um, everything he does and and has to make it creative. Uh, <laughs> you know, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, but um, I, I guess I got to let our guests know what you're all about. You flew... Uh, for Southwest Airlines for 25 years, Correct. Uh, you got into the pilot program at a time when, uh, you know, they were only letting people in with like certain degrees and, you know, Vietnam pilots and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you came in and, and got picked. Um, and you're also the lead singer, rock star of the band uh, CTS called to serve. Um, and it's a you, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian rock band, but you are a Christian rock band. You you talk about some really great, uh, you sing about some really great themes, and I love your music. Uh, and uh, But here's the great part, and we're going to show some footage in a, in a few seconds, but uh, Jeff actually became... Do you ever watch those Hollywood movies where the you know the the planes are flying and they're doing these amazing stunts, you know, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and all this stuff? Well, Jeff's the guy who not only coordinates that, flies some of those planes, but uh, but he films it. He is a stunt pilot, plane coordinator for Hollywood. So we're going to talk about that. Jeff, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, thank you, Brad. What an honor. Um, you know, I've watched your shows; they're amazing. So. I'm amongst amazing company and, and very honored. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, let's dig in. Uh, you know, you grew up uh, with with parents who were who were a little tough. They expected you to go out and and like my parents, <laughs> they were sort of mm -hmm. like, hey, you got to you got to fend for yourself. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I was actually blessed. I call it to to have parents that. Uh, you know, taught me the, those values, you know, back, even back to the first bike I wanted, you know, my dad, I wanted a bike and I was probably, I don't know, seven, eight years old. And, and dad said, well, you know, I'll help you buy a bike, but you have to help earn part of it or half of it, or if I remember right. So, you know, as a, at a young age, I was taught that nothing comes for free and you got to go so I mowed lawns, you know, weeded yards for neighbors, took care of their pets during the the summer months when they were gone and, and earned money to, to pay for a good part of my bike. And so that started the trend. And I've, my whole life has been that basically. My dad, he was always like, you want to pay how much for sneakers? Like $40 for a pair of Pumas, which today is like, wow, that's cheap. But back then right. he goes, I'm not going to give you money for a, you know, and he used a few expletives. For $40 right. sneakers. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $20 for the sneakers, but you got to come up with the rest. So I did paper routes. I'm like you, yeah. I did a paper route. I did all this stuff. Um, but it, it's just, it, it's just funny. I think those values uh, have been lost a little bit in America. This kind of tough love for our kids instead of, you know, babying them through everything. It's sort of like, Hey, you got, this is going to be real life when you grow up. Okay. And yeah. yes, you can play and you can have your cartoons, but you got to go get a job. And, <laughs> and that's how I was raised. So uh, I yeah. believe that's a, the right way to raise kids. That way we don't have adults who are sitting there going, Oh, you know, I, I deserve that raise. Well, you didn't work as hard. So don't, don't yeah. think you're equal pay. Uh, well, and my, my kids are the same. They're all on their own. They're in their mid twenties and, and they, they, uh, all self-supporting, productive citizens of the, the country. And, 
you know, cause we raised him like the same way, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah. And I, I think we're, we're raising kids, this participation trophy thing where everybody gets a trophy for showing up. That's not, you know, that's not yeah. reality in life. So, yeah. yeah. I tell people who want to hire, you know, better at their companies. I said, look for the kids who went through the scouting programs or, they, uh, you know, they, they were in the martial arts because those are not, oh, you showed up. Here's a belt. No, you had to earn that belt. So they understand that. Um, right. So let's get into this. You, uh, you became a pilot, but tell me how, the story because you became a pilot, uh, the people that helped train you, and then you wound up at Southwest. Let's talk uh-huh. about this because this is like the luck of the draw uh, for you. you. You just believed in it. Uh, and you yeah. went for it. Well, I, I got the bug at a young age. My dad was an adventure seeker and, you know, surfing, scuba diving, uh, and he was a private pilot. So, uh, so man, was, man stuff. It was, yeah. <laughs> so probably against my mom's better wishes at five years old, he strapped me in this uh, car, uh, car seat in a Piper Cub and off we went. And so I had the bug at a young age. I didn't consider doing it uh, as a living until probably, probably in the late high school, early college, but I was poor. I didn't have a lot of money. My parents didn't have a lot of money. And so I thought, well, I'll become a fighter pilot in the military. And I went to the recruiter and uh, the recruiter was like, well, you're, you know, you're good to go, except you wear, you wear glasses. And I said, well, I wear contact lenses and glasses. He said, well, you, you can't be a fighter pilot unless you have perfect vision going in. Right. And that was a big disappointment for me. It was a, a my kind of dream squashed from the get-go. So I decided I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to figure out a way to uh, earn my ratings and get get my uh, my hours up and, and become a, a professional pilot. And at the time, it was very difficult. Uh, there wasn't a lot of demand for pilots as there is today. And so I worked different jobs and, and, you know, you name it, fast food, whatever, whatever it was, sweeping floors, cleaning homes and, and to earn enough uh, time to get some hours in the plane and get my ratings. And then I eventually got a jet type, Lear type in uh, Van Nuys Airport and uh, learned, uh, flew celebrities around, movie stars, CEOs, uh, the, the company I worked for did aerial photography with a system called AstroVision. And I learned the trade with that basically it, as a jet, as a dolly in the sky, like a 300 mile yeah. an hour dolly. And uh, then I went on to different operators, uh, learned, and then I went on to compete against them because uh, the guy that invented that system designed a new system called Vector Vision. I went on to fly that for years. And, and the, the credits on that, you know, True Lies, Executive Decision, uh, Hot Shots, Space Cowboys, Silence of the Lambs. And I flew the uh, film, The Blue Angels, Thunderbirds, the U.S., uh, 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 the Canadian Snowbirds, and NASA Research out of Edwards. I, I had a, a – uh, it launched a career that I had no idea – where it would go, you know, and I was just this young guy, 11, 11 flying, you know, sitting in a room with astronauts or the blue angels and going, <laughs> whoa, you know, here's this kid that was told that I would never fly a fighter, be a fighter pilot, you know, and here I am sitting in the same room with the blue angels or the snowbirds or the, the, the thunderbirds. So, and then in 1993, I got, I got the dream shot got hired at Southwest Airlines, spent 25 years there as a captain. We're going to show some of that footage right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, get ready. Uh, what what are these scenes we're going to be seeing? Yeah, so picture when you're in the audience, uh, most people it's, don't realize how a shot of a jet, another jet in flight is, is done. A drone isn't fast enough. Back then, drones weren't even around. A helicopter is not fast enough. Um, so picture a, another jet next to a jet that they want to film, like the Blue Angels or like the picture behind me. That's a 
787 out of Boeing that was right off the assembly line, the little jet is me. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm a dolly and I can maneuver around. So the shots, you'll, the video you'll see is, is just this, this beautiful, you know, flowing of, of the camera basically dollying around the, the subject airplane. And we create right. these beautiful shots. All right, folks, here it is. Uh, take a look at Jeff's work. You know, that's something else, uh, what you do. Some of the movies you've worked on, you've gotten to meet like uh, some pretty famous celebrities. Like uh, you you spent some time with Arnold Schwarzenegger and a few yeah. others, right? Yeah. I uh, have flown Arnold. I've, I look back, I've, you know, I flew Johnny Carson, Ed McMahon, Doc Severinsen, uh, oh. Catherine Hepburn, Bob Hope, um, pretty much uh, Clint Eastwood, I don't know. I, I go in my logbook and I kind of marvel at like, wow. And uh, John Travolta, I got to know John pretty well. Wow. Actually. <laughs> so, you know, you spend time with these people and they're, they're trusting you to keep them safe and out of, out of harm's way. And you get to know them, but you, you realize that they're just regular people. And that's one thing they, they, it taught me meeting those people. It was like, yes, they, you know, like one of my funnest stories is with, with John Travolta. We're sitting on the ramp one night under this beautiful Southern California sky, and we're talking about life and family. And and he he goes, you know, Jeff, I just I wish I could just meet a nice girl and get married. <laughs> and you go, you're John Travolta. Are you kidding? You know, you just in your mind, you're like they're probably lined up for miles and. And, but he goes, that's the, that's the thing. I, I want to meet somebody that loves me for who I am, not what I am. Yeah. And, and that's a good life lesson, you know, of it they're is. just people. So, they are. Can you tell the story of uh, when you were chosen for Southwest, you're in this room with all these other people and, and they had to uh, say what they did you know, or, or their experience as a pilot. And you're like, what? So I love that story. <laughs> tell, tell this uh, story. Yeah. So in the, you get in the new hire class and you're sitting there with all these other pilots, just probably think there were about 20 in my class. And so you're excited and you're all pumped up and, and uh, they go around the room and say, okay, tell us a little about yourself and your experience and your background. And, and so I'm, you know, you know, you're going down the line and well, I'm, you know, John Smith and I'm, you know, I was a, I was an astronaut, you know, I'm, uh, you know, Ted Jones and I'm, uh, I was a blue angel and I was this and I was that and I fought in the war and I've, you know, fought and I mean, you just go, okay, how, you know, <laughs> how do I even have a chance to be here? You know, so yeah. I'm amongst, I'm amongst giants. And so, but 
uh, yeah, big honor. And just to get hired at Southwest was, I know we've had our problems lately, but, uh, uh, that's a whole other conversation, but you know, it's, uh, just to get hired there was, was a dream shot. So, yeah. Well, they were only taking people with like bachelor's degrees. Am I right? And, and then a bunch of, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Vietnam vets, you know, were standing up and, and, you know, introducing themselves and you're sitting there going, well, I, I took lessons. <laughs> <laughs> what you were What's doing amazing is, work. yeah. What's amazing is they, they, uh, I got, I earned a lot of respect from them doing the film work. You know, they saw a lot of my work because they knew that's very close formation. It's dangerous. It's, it's, you got to be very calculated in what you do. You know, you, you get up next to a dreamliner, that thing can roll you right up over it and kill you yeah. pretty quick. And so, so I did earn a lot of respect and it, Southwest was like a family back then you had to have about 3,500 hours minimum to even get an interview. You had to have a Boeing 737 type rating. And that was a, a pretty hefty investment to get that rating. And that was just right. to get an interview. So you, you didn't know you had to get the rating and spend the money to even get an interview. All right. People don't, uh, I don't think people understand when you have a large jet, it's creating this backdraft that can be felt for miles behind its trail. Just like a, just like an ocean liner leaves a wake, uh, yeah. a jet, a, a large jet leaves a wake behind it of air and so this your smaller jet is coming up behind it and all you're dealing with is turbulence through all that so you have to be very calculated uh, on the angles you know and uh folks you know sometimes uh from wingtip to wingtip they might only be 30 feet apart uh and it's dangerous work and jeff does it really really well and, and by the way those of you who are listening to this on apple please tune in on youtube our rumble uh so you can see some of the video footage uh i'm going to be showing uh on this episode but um jeff you, the guy who invented this uh, you know this type of dolly system in the way of shooting how did you meet him um and and you can you can mention his name if you want but um you got a chance to meet him and he then he trained you yeah so I had worked for the company that he had designed a system called Astrovision many years ago, which revolutionized aerial photography. Up until then, he uh, they had hung out the back of a B-25 and mm -hmm. literally pulled the plane up behind and they <laughs> would shoot the camera. And it was a real limited view, you know, of what they could right. do. His A friend of his fell out of the back of the B-25 <gasps> to his death. And he just so he designed Astrovision, which is a periscope that goes through the belly of the Learjet and through this, the roof. And it's a 360 degree pan, tilts almost straight down. It's a tilting prism, basically. Right. And so the jet, the Learjet is the dolly that you pull up. And of course, you don't hit the other plane. And uh, so he he separated from the original uh, operator, and then went on to invent a new system called Vector Vision. I was on different sets with directors and producers. I I worked on Murder, She Wrote, Fall Guy. I was doing like little taxi scenes, flybys, and his name's Bob Netman. He was a five-time Academy Award winner for his designs, and and met me, and we we you know latched on as friends. And he said, "I'm inventing a new mm -hmm. system." called Vector Vision, and would you be interested in flying it? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah. that's where it started. That's fantastic. But how did you get into Hollywood? I mean, you you just offered your services, or how did that happen? Well, I was flying charters and flying people around, and, you know, it, 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 it ties into, uh, I think, any person getting into any field is, especially maybe a, as a mentor to our young ones today that, you know, kindness and, you know, work ethic will, will get you further in life than any degree or anything. Because if you, yeah. if you're nice to people and you treat them with kindness and you give them good service, you're on time, you're polite, you know, people take you under their wing because they go, Hey, you know, I've got this show called murder. She wrote, um, 
you know, what was it? Angela Lansbury. It was a, it was a hit for years. And, right. you know, I, I need, I need a taxi scene or I need a jet to fly by the, through the camera, you know, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you in screen actors guild to help you get in. So people help people and, and really it was just being professional and kind. And, and one thing, you know, people open doors for people they like, and that's how I got yeah. into it. That's fantastic. Uh, it is, it is that way. I remember I was working at a company when I first went to New York city and after three months, they realized they had spent way too much to launch the company. And mm -hmm. so they started laying people off. And for some reason they laid me off despite the fact that over the past three months, clients always chose my work. And mm -hmm. I realized the, the, one of the co-owners, he just wanted people he could control. And, yeah. and so he got rid of me. Now, fast forward, maybe two years later, I'm working at this company doing slides and, and video, and I'm doing graphic design. Uh, the company was Salisbury and Salisbury. Two brothers founded it in New York City. And what happened is that co-owner of the company I got fired from, um, he had gotten bought out and you know he was now back on the street peddling, you know, doing his services. Well, he yeah. showed up for an interview, he saw me and turned white as a ghost. Cause he realized you ain't getting this sale, buddy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think any young people have been taught this nowadays, but that is those of the people that you meet on the way up the ladder of your career are the same ones you're going to meet going down the ladder of your career. So yeah. there is something called kismet as, as the Yiddish say, uh, or, or, you know, uh, serendipity, whatever you want to call it. But that yeah. person that you treated badly, it'll come back to you. Trust me. Absolutely. And yeah. the person you treated with grace and love and respect, that'll come back to you too. So yeah, you're a testament yeah. to that, my friend. Oh, so um, wow. let's, uh, you, you retired. You, now you spent 25 years flying for Southwest. Right. And uh, talk about your retirement. You got a very special gift uh, from the CEO, I believe. Yeah, in 2015, I won the President's Award at Southwest Airlines. And you have to kind of be nominated. So they, uh, you're nominated by your peers and people uh, in the company. And they pick, a, I forget, however many a year. And they bring you to this big luncheon in Dallas. And it's a, they make a big deal out of it's a it's a huge honor and i was nominated for basically what we do with our band honoring our veterans and our country and the first responders and i the music i write is all about this kind of stuff like we talked about kindness love forgiveness um so yeah. we do a lot for the communities so we went to the uh the luncheon and i got to sit with gary kelly the ceo and gary had met me uh, years prior when we opened Terminal 4 in Phoenix, our band played CTS Perform there. And we got to meet Gary and, and talk to him. So during that conversation, all he wanted to talk about was the band and my music. And, you know, and because and, and, he plays guitar, he's a hobby guitar player. And all the right. chief pilots were there and we're sitting there talking about music. And during that conversation, he says, you know, I have a Taylor guitar have you heard of a Taylor guitar? I said, yes, I have a Taylor guitar. I love my Taylor. He says, well, I have one and I'd, I'd like to give it to you. And I said, well, you're kidding. You, you mean not sell it? He goes, no, I'd like to give it to you. And I said, why would you do that? And he goes, because we just think you're the spirit of Southwest Airlines and what you do in the community with your music. And it's just a, a gift to say thank you. And I was like, wow i go okay gary the only way i'll accept it is if you autograph it and sign it so i have a a taylor guitar from gary it's actually painted like a southwest jet and uh, <laughs> and uh he gave it to me and it was yeah that's a gift of a lifetime so so i used to get that guitar out and i would play it to our passengers while we were boarding <laughs> that was always fun <laughs> so I love your spirit. I love how you do things. And uh, this is a great 
you you actually kind of led into your rock band CTS, which is short for Called to Serve. Um, and you do concerts and you honor the veterans out there, uh, especially the disabled veterans. You've um, and your band is extraordinary. Uh, let me play a little bit of of your music right now. You guys live in concert. Here we go, Jeff Senior and CTS. God puts us here as a, as a soul. We all have a soul, we all have a purpose, we all have gifts. And I think God gives us each uh, a different gifts. There's seven and a half or eight billion people on planet Earth. I like to talk about uh, a billion, a billion seconds is 31 years. There's eight billion of us on Earth and we all get a gift. We all, and it's the soul He gives us. And the soul, the soul is eternal. The body's temporary. You know, this journey here called life, we don't know how long we're going to get. You know, 80 years is the average lifespan, so, which is about 30,000 days. So whether we get more or less, no one knows that time. It, it's short, and we don't know how much time we get, but it's what we do with it while we're here. And that gives me the perspective of the world to write the music that I write, because it's when you're seven miles up, and I've spent a lot of time up there, you know, 40, 45,000 feet, and you realize that there's every human emotion possible probably going on at that given moment with 15 million, 15 million people, and you get to see that, and you go, you know, wow, can you imagine? There, there's probably love, division, hatred, crime. There's, you know, it's all going on at the same time, and, and you get to kind of have this vast, you know, God's eye view of that. And so, and I could, I just always thank you, God, for the, the ability and the gift you gave me to, to share this with people and get to do this. So uh, I know one day that will end as, as you age out or whatever, but every, every moment I get to do it is a blessing. I get to live two of my passions. I've been in movies, I've flown in movies, I've, uh, aerial cinematography, feature films, and uh, flown famous people around. So I get to do what what I love. I just I love what you do, man. I really do. Thanks, and, Brad. Uh, because Thank you. I have two uh, great uncles. One served at the, and they both served in World War II. Uh, one survived the Battle of Midway, only to be sunk two weeks later uh, wow, <laughs> near Okinawa. Wow. And then uh, my other great uncle uh, loaded the Enola Gay uh, wow. before its maiden voyage. And that's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah and I, they never talked about it. That was the weird part. I never knew about their valor until you know I was an adult, and they passed away as very old men. So that's who uh, they are. They don't talk about it. They're heroes. No. But, yeah. Not at all. But let's talk about it. how did you form the band? What what made you get together? You know, it's like you see these commercials where these guys, oh, I'm getting the band back together. But you guys, <laughs> you did it. You you made a band and yeah. you've been doing it for a while. Yeah. Well, I, and I my mom was a violinist, so I got the music gene from her. Right. And uh, so I was in I was in band. I played guitar. I was in bands and in, in all through high school and college and rock bands, cover bands. Um, my mom, what a, what a saint, you know, she let us practice in our garage <laughs> growing <laughs> up, <laughs> making yeah. a bunch of noise in the neighborhood. But, practice. Uh, I remember yeah, those. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're a musician yourself. And so, and then I, when I pursued my flying career, I didn't perform much. I still played, but I didn't perform. And then in uh, 2000, about 2000, 2001, I was playing in a worship team at a church and I just thought, you know, I'd like to start a band and I started writing and I had never written before. I started writing music and I, and once I got that bug to write music and the creativity of it, I just loved it and I was addicted to it. And so yeah. it was my drug. And so I wrote song after song after song um, and I started CTS in, uh, about 2001. And my goal was to touch lives through our music in, in a positive way and, and honor 
people like our veterans, our first responders, you know, America. And so we put something bigger than ourselves ahead of what we are. It wasn't about look at us. We're in a band. And the doors that open have opened for that. Are, are just remarkable. We've played in the Pentagon, Pearl Harbor. We played the 105th birthday of Ray Chavez. He was the oldest Pearl Harbor survivor on the USS Midway. Wow. You know, the, the journeys we've had with the band, we've played with high school orchestras and we have some kind of interesting news. We just, just got signed with Universal, which is kind of. That's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. I didn't even tell you about that. <laughs> so. Wow. I'm the first to get an interview with you where to uh, be before you're really famous. <laughs> like you're- you. And you know, Brad, it's not about fame to me. It, yeah. If I can, if I can touch through our music, millions of lives, it, because this world needs hope right now. It needs, it needs direction. It needs, you know, people to lift them up and go, come on, let's, let's, you know, you live in America. Yeah. You know what? It, 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 you know, there's no line to get out. If you think it's so bad here, you know, you have every opportunity. You can start in the mail room and become the CEO of a company in America. Yeah. And so that's what we're about. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, you know, universal, I'm kind of still almost overwhelmed. And so I'm working on all of that. That's going to be announced here fairly quick. By the time this comes out, it'll probably be announced and, and then so, I have a book coming out and it's all kind so, of crazy. So you, you're an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I take my hat off to your hard, hard work. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been watching you for years. You know, we've, we've hung out, we've broken bread. You know, we've, uh, we met yeah. through uh, uh, Leah Woodford and her husband, Paul Woodford. I have mm-hmm. to give a shout out and thank them for introducing us. Um, Absolutely. And, I, and I remember I was keynoting one of their events and you get up on stage and you were just, you were in your element, man. You had that, that Southwest guitar, that Taylor guitar, mm-hmm. and you were just having a good old time on stage, uh, playing and telling your story. So, um, I love your work, man. Uh, Thank you, Brad. Sure, and, sure. and yours as well. You're, Thank we got, you. We got, kin, we're kindred brothers, brothers. Yeah, we, we have we, the same heart. Yeah. Thank you. We, I, I do believe that we truly do. Uh, cause sometimes we'll, we, folks, you may not know this, but I'll schedule a meeting with Jeff and we'll spend a half hour just talking, you know, about stuff, you know, the, the world life, you know, faith, God, politics, you know, and, uh, and then we go, Oh wait, we only have an hour. We, we gotta, we, <laughs> we gotta start doing some business. So, yeah. um, I, I want to talk about, you got a chance to work with Gary Sinise and he's doing a similar work. You know, he, he discovered after being, in Forrest Gump, that character, Lieutenant Dan, uh, all our vets kind of really super identified with him, especially that, that cathartic moment where he's screaming at God on the, on the mast of the ship. Like he wanted to die. He yeah. wanted to die. And then he had that moment of faith where he goes, I want to live. And that changed everything from that moment on. And that that is his iconic breakout role. I think everybody knew Gary Sinise. You know, he had been on these shows, and he would always, he almost always played a cop or a detective or FBI agent. You yeah, know, he's a clean cut kind of tough guy look. But uh, it was the <laughs> character Lieutenant Dan from yeah. Forrest Gump, and then he he started to go around and create a mission um, to help the vets as well. And he has a band, and you got a chance to meet him and perform with him. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, and the story behind that is in uh, early 2000s, somewhere in there, we got 2000, probably seven or eight. We got, we, I met up with one of our pilots at Southwest that was involved with an organization called Snowball Express. And I was like, well, what's that? It sounds like a train or something, you know, but Snowball right. Express was a, a 501C that started to, uh, that took the Gold Star families at that time the Iraq war and all was going on, Afghanistan, the families that had lost a loved one while serving, most of them in combat. Uh, So the widows and the children, and they would, and so American Airlines brought 2000 of them every year. And it started out at Oakley headquarters uh, in California. It moved Mm -hmm. eventually to Dallas. And then now it's in Orlando, Florida. 
um, the first year we played, we got invited to perform at Oakley headquarters. And I sat on the stage, you know, we did our sound check. We're looking out there and I kind of didn't know what to expect. And 22 busloads of widows and children rolled up in front of us and they got out and stood at the front of the stage. And it hit me, the sacrifice that our veterans and the families endure, you know, that some of the kids had never even met their dad because he went off to war and never came home. Wow. And so that, so we performed, that's when I met Gary, we opened for his band. And after uh, that year, I wrote the song called Snowball Express. It's on iTunes and it's just an honor song honoring the Gold Star families. People that don't know what a Gold Star is, it's, it, it's families that have lost a loved one in military service. And uh, we just can't say enough thanks. And you meet the, these moms, some of them are dads and kids that are just, will never see their spouse again or their, their parent. And you just, yeah. you know, we can't t thank them enough. Freedom isn't free. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, it's hard to get across to young people today, unless they've served in the military or they were raised in a conservative household. It's hard to get across to someone who hasn't been, you know, taught this. But most of the world, and, and I'm talking probably sixty to seventy percent, um, is a hellhole to live in. Yeah, you know, they they, they don't have running water or toilets, and I, I'm not saying you know. Well, they should have capitalism. I'm talking about where drug lords live, places where the population lives on $2 a day. They can barely scrape that up. Um, places yeah. where the kids go to school barefoot. You know, the, the family has to make sandals out of cardboard and glue. You know, it's uh, people don't realize that's the way the rest of the world lives. We're incredibly blessed here in the United States to have, uh, you know, this, this, it's not freedom. It's the ability to move up the ladder, not live in a caste society, uh, not live in a neighborhood where you're tortured every day. You're afraid your kids can't go to school. We live in a truly blessed world. Uh, and, you know, if, if the United States of America falls, people are going to find out very, very quickly uh, what totalitarianism is, because once rights are gone, once the U.S. is gone and everything about it. Um, those in power always take control. It's it's history. It's historically yeah. proven. That, well, we owe so much to our founding fathers. They were brilliant, brilliant men. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if America goes away, th this is the last bastion of hope on the planet. Yeah. Um, I actually did a commercial in in Africa. I flew a jet all over Africa, filming Mount Kilimanjaro, Victoria Falls. You know, I've I've seen people dying in the streets. I've witnessed women carrying water on their heads. Yeah, just and you just go whoa. And I think every American should witness that. I wish they could because oh, they, yeah. they'd have a whole new appreciation. Yeah, they need to travel more instead of listening to some teacher who gave them some, you know, America's bad. You look what they did over over there, you know, and you're like, you don't realize uh, if America hadn't stepped in in some of these areas, it would be it would be far worse. I mean, they, they would slaughter people by the hundreds of thousands, yeah. you know, it's just it's astounding to me. And people like you who have faith and, and you the work you do. Um, I just, I just love it. You and Allison are, are just, you know, your, your spark of light or right. yeah. what was it that Willy Wonka said? The original Willy Wonka in the movie with Gene Wilder, he goes, so sheds a, a light in a weary world, yeah. you know, and that's you, you shed a light in the, oh. weary, in, a, in the weary world. So I thank you. Now, oh, um, do, uh, do you want to talk about you, you, would, you and Allison got together, um, and, and, uh, you adopted a child. Now you had other children. Did both of you have children or no? So Al Allison was, uh, uh, I adopted a child from a prior marriage. And so Allison came in to the picture later as a step parent, yeah. which is probably one of the hardest roles you could ever. <laughs> oh, I know. For. I know. You know, Al, uh, so, uh, yes, I, so I had, 
adopted Sylvia. I had uh, one, uh, actually a, a son and, and a daughter, and then we lost a little boy at birth. And that led us to adopt Sylvia in Bulgaria. She was born without a right hand and mm -hmm. dumped in an orphanage. Uh, and we went and got her. First, I was kind of like, I don't know if I want to go over to some third world country and pick up a kid, you know. But, right. but one day I was like, you know, let's do this. And so we, we brought her brought her home and she's now 25 years old, <laughs> uh, a, a productive member of society. She's a legal immigrant. She got her citizenship at 19. Wow. And yeah, she's amazing. She works at Albertson's grocery store near us. She lives on her own with a roommate and she's just, she's just a breath of fresh air. Um, and then, you know, she, the loss of that child, it's amazing how he never, um, came into this world and had a chance to live, but he changed lives. You know, we, we adopted Sylvia. We, I had another son, Parker, uh, had a, uh, so I have four children total. And then I divorced and, uh, living in a dumpy apartment. I ended up buying a house and I'd have the kids half the time. And, and when I bought this house in this beautiful area, I love in uh, Mesa. And one day there's a knock on the door and I open up, it was about three weeks after I moved there, open up the door and, and there's this beautiful woman standing there and I go, hi, can I help you? And she goes, well, I'm Allison. I'm the lady who bought your house from and I was visiting some friends up the street and thought I'd stop by and see how the new owner likes his house. And Parker, who was at five at the time, puts his hands out and says, hi, I'm Parker. It's nice to meet you. Well, he's the one that won. He's the one that won her over. He, <laughs> he melted her heart right on the spot. And so the, so I, the rest is history. I, uh, I call it for sale with owner, you know, it's a, it's a <laughs> so I bought her house and then, uh, here we are. We've been married 15 years now. So, you know, you know, this is a hallmark moment. We could make this into a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of a cool story yeah. and, you know, and, What's amazing about her, you talk about a servant. She, she was a United flight attendant, 28 years. She was, you know, living the dream. She scuba dived all over the world. She traveled the world. And then she chose to be with myself and my children and, and raise them. She never had any of her own. And, and from day one, I told the kids, she has every bit of authority as I do. So you listen to her and obey her. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, that's how it should work yeah absolutely. i've raised i've raised up kids too if yeah. you're not a unified front man it does no. not work yeah no um i want you to realize that uh, ladies and gentlemen if you if you haven't figured it out um jeff is incredibly humble like like he doesn't realize allison walked in and went wow this guy's a pilot he's scuba dives he's done all these things yeah and you know, you're an equal match, a beautiful, um, wonderful, equal match because of your service as well, my friend. Um, and uh, it works because the two of you, you, you're kindred souls, as I like to call it. Uh, yeah. And I can see it. So it's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. I always look at her all the time and go, how did I get you? You know, yeah. how, did I, how did I manage this? <laughs> Luckiest guy in the whole wide world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. She's, she's a blessing. So. So did you get a chance to meet Gary Sinise at that gig? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Several gigs. And we played subsequent years and opened for him. And he's, he's such a, for a Hollywood guy, yeah. he's, he's incredible. I mean, he just breaks the mold. He's, he's, he doesn't care. He just honors our, our veterans and he's just yeah. a servant's heart. The Gary Sinise foundation now runs snowball express. And oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he took it over. And now it's in Orlando. Right. So they bring all the gold stars out to uh, Orlando, Florida, now Disney World and, and all of that. So that's amazing. Wow. I, yeah, I'd he's love a great get, guy. I'd love to get him on the show, but um, and talk about the, the how, how an iconic role like that can change his, an actor's life, you know? Yeah. So yeah. That's pretty amazing. So um, let's talk about your faith because. Uh, you and I have had many uh, a conversation about God, Jesus, um, you know, uh, the world that we're living in today, and uh, 
your band, you know, you're like Creed almost, you know, you're singing about some topics that some people find incredibly uncomfortable, which I, I don't understand. You know, it's a, uh, we're living in a day and age where we are really divided and yeah. uh, you bring people together, which is what I love about it. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, when, yeah. when did you, um, when did you become a follower of Christ or was that, always I was, there? I was, well, I was, my mom and dad were Christian, but we didn't go to church or anything, right. you know, but those values were there. Um, I, I accepted Christ when I was in high school. I met a, a guy that I went to high school with. He was a, a real, uh, you know, on fire for God back then. And so, you know, I started going to Bible studies and he was a big mentor in my life, even though he was my same age. And then uh, I ended up getting baptized in the Pacific Ocean. And wow. yeah, so, uh, and then I've been, you know, uh, pretty much, you know, a follower ever since, you know, there's been times in my life that, you know, I guess we all are not proud of, you know, roads I've gone down. Some of the music I've written are about, you know, I've gone down, you know, one of the songs I wrote is, is called Here I Am. It's about, you know, down a lonely road searching for the truth, you know, every turn leads me to you. And then you turn around in your darkest hour and the chorus of the song goes, it's God saying, here I am waiting for you. Wow. And ne- I never left you, even though we betray him so many times in this, this journey, you know, that he's he's just he's unfor- he's just forgiving and never wavering yeah. and he go he goes here i am waiting for you here i am what i say is true you know the, the song's kind of a rock ballad and yeah. so um we i think we've all gone down roads in life we're not proud of and it's you know the grace of god i i had a, a friend of mine that i was flying with once at southwest and he's telling me i just feel jeff if i if I'm a good, if I'm a good person, because I think I'm a good person, if there is a heaven and a God, then, then I'll go there, you know. Right. And I said, well, if 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 being good meant going to heaven, none of us would go <laughs> because <laughs> none of us are worthy of that. Yeah. And so that so God's pretty specific in that what He asks of us, but it's pretty simple. It's not yeah. a hard deal. I believe. Uh in two things one is that yeah you got it you got to submit to you know sp- the holy spirit god christ and listen <laughs> you know that's part of it <laughs> okay listen yeah. we don't yeah. always get it perfect and then the second thing i believe is we're supposed to get the very most out of that dash between the day we were born and the day we die yeah and that is you know the gift of life should never be taken advantage of. Um, I've worked with people who after their day job, all they do is go home and sit and watch TV and make dinner. And that's it. They, they don't try to do anything else. They don't uh, help with charity. They don't uh, create things. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody has cycles in their life, but I feel there's, there's a chance to give back daily. For me, it's yeah, my, sense of humor, my sense of humor. I always <laughs> see a situation and I'll just, you know, make people crack up or I'll see the same people at the coffee shop and I turn around and go, you again, you know, and they start <laughs> laughing. Yeah. And, uh, my nemesis, they start cracking up and we'll sit and talk. And, um, you know, we each as a soul being or as a person or an individual, we have a gift that we carry in our heart. And it's our job to serve that to others um, mm-hmm. because other people, they, they don't get a chance maybe to do that. Maybe they're inspired by what you and I do or other people do. And it's just a chance to make the world a little bit better place. Uh, yeah. I feel. Uh, I talk about the dash, you know, it's, it's so funny how similar we are. And, you know, it says in Isaiah that, you know, I, I, before, basically before the, the world was created, God knew your death, your journey. And he knew when you'd be born, he knew when you were going to be here. I feel we were chosen. We are living in some of the most amazing times of humanity right now. We're witnessing yep. biblical prophecy, you know, come alive and we were yep. chosen to be here. And so we are that light in this world. 
and and so yeah it's remarkable it is i've sometimes asked myself why am i here you know i do too yeah. you know because it's like why because everything seems to be getting worse and i'm like why am i here and the answer <laughs> i got back is you know it's like christmas tree lights uh each one is lit and it's there to stabilize the earth right now during this dark period because if we weren't here it would be a lot darker yeah and you don't you know you just have to show up with your light and that's it yeah we played uh last year we played at soul fest it's in new hampshire and it's it's put on by dan russell who uh used to manage you too and so oh, wow. it's a it's a three-day uh, christian music festival it's our second year there and they have a candlelight service so cts got to play ten thousand people in front of us wow. and we did a candlelight service and they started with one candle and then while we were playing and we we did we played my song one life we talk about the dash and and they started with one candle and lit two and two became four four became and it multiplied up this ski slope with ten thousand people and and it it was it was all I could do to hold the tears back watching. And it made me realize that one life, one person, one light in this world, you and I and others can create other lights and light, you know, and, and bring light to this yeah. world. And that's, that's really our mission here. You know, it is, it really is. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, where do people go uh, to, to know about the band, know about you, things like that. Uh, you get, our website is ctsmusic.com, ctsmusic.com. Uh, if you go on Spotify, uh, iTunes, YouTube, uh, just type in Jeff Sr. We go by Jeff Sr. and Call to Serve. So it, it's Jeff and then S-E-N-O-U-R. So just type in, in any search engine, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, you know, Facebook, you know, yeah. all that, all that stuff. We're going to put that in the show notes. Uh, I am so honored to have you on the show today. Uh, if you have a few more minutes, I'm going to do a lightning round of questions to see uh, if there's a few deeper things we can go for. Are you ready? Uh oh, okay. <laughs> I guess. Uh, what makes you mad? Uh, some of the drivers on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, pilot yeah. in me comes out because we're taught situational awareness and being yeah. aware of what's around you. And most drivers don't have a clue. And I get, I oh. get, uh, it drives me. So anyway, my wife has to calm me down. With yeah. the driving. <laughs> well, my, my dad, uh, he, he taught me pay attention, pay attention mm -hmm. to what's going on. Don't let the car drive you, you that, yeah. drive the car. And That's so, situational awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if my, my girlfriend ever notices this about me, but I never daydream when I'm driving. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's an engine that's shut off. I'm always looking, you know, checking. Um, I was made uh, aware by my driver's ed teacher about uh, driver hypnosis. When you start doing exactly what the car in front of you is doing, um, mm. I really work hard not to do that, things like that. Yeah, you'd make a good pilot. No, thanks. <laughs> Except uh, I'm afraid of heights. That's my, my big problem. <laughs> uh, it took me the longest time to get in a jet and not uh, have butterflies in my stomach when I would fly. And I've, yeah. I've flown a lot, you know, especially 2014. I was flying so much. I just, I would go to sleep on the plane because I'd be somewhere else every week. Yeah. So. I tell uh, people, think of it this way. They used to take covered wagons. It was very dangerous. Airplanes are much safer. <laughs> yeah. You could get yeah. shot, an arrow in your head. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I know. Uh, my second question is uh, basically, what other frontiers do you want to achieve? Is there anything you want to go after yet in life? Uh, I, uh, not particularly. I mean, I'm finishing up, <laughs> finishing up a book. You know, so that's been when's you know, that coming which, out? Which which you were part of uh, yes. as well. Um, uh, very soon, it, it, it's actually 
on Amazon. I haven't really announced it yet. And okay. so working on that, but, um, uh, but as far as frontiers that, you know, I fly helicopters, I fly jets. A lot of times people go, well, why don't you retire? You know, I, you know, and I, my answer to them is like, what would you suggest I do? I fly yeah. a jet at 45,000 feet. I, a uh, corporate jet. I meet incredibly amazing people. I fly a helicopter through the cliffs of Sedona, witnessing God's creation and beauty, taking people yeah. through a bucket list ride. You know, would you suggest I play golf or what would you suggest that I, cause I suck at golf. So <laughs> People don't realize you're not that kind of guy and neither am I, you know, yeah. I have friends who are just, they're retired. They're doing stuff and they're this and that. And it's like, no, I, I live in Denver. I've lived in Las Vegas. The, you know, I'm not somebody who can sit on my butt and oh. just go, okay, I'm retired. I don't even know how to play golf. So I have to learn. And, uh, I, I stink at golf too, because, uh, I hit it like a baseball bat, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you and I are a little muscular, you know? So it's sort of like, I'm going to hit this thing. You know, it's right. Like, the death grip. Yeah, yeah. The death grip. It's like, yeah. you don't want me on your golf team. Trust me. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I played with my wife when we were dating, she liked golf. And one day I, I hit it and it went about a hundred feet in the air and landed five feet in front of her. And this was off the tee. And I'll, and she looks at me and I, she goes, I, I don't even quite know what to tell you what you did wrong, but I think you need some lessons. <laughs> <laughs> lessons about relaxation that's right hard. yeah right oh that's horrible my uh my last question uh i love to ask and that is um what is the legacy you want to leave behind you know you're 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 a pilot you've done all these movies uh where you've filmed everything you're a rock star you know pilot by day rock star by night um what do you want on, on, let's say, on your tombstone after you pass from this world? It's funny you ask because I, I talk about this stuff. And, you know, to me, it's, and I've been blessed to fly famous people around, hobnob with those kind of people. And I've realized that it's not, it's not the car you drive. It's not the house you have or how big it is or what fame you have or how much money you have in the bank. In the end, that dash that you talked about, is truly the legacy we leave behind. And that's, that's about, he was kind, he was loving, he treated people with respect and dignity. He, he left this world a better place than he came into it. He tried every, every attempt, every day was a blessing of, he tried to figure out how to have, be a servant, how to have a servant's heart. And those are the things that I hope in the end that, you know, uh, that, that uh, I will be remembered by yeah. not how much money I had, you know, people, when, when you go to a funeral, people don't say, man, that guy was amazing. Cause he worked so much overtime at the <laughs> office, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's all about, he was a great father. He was a great husband, a great son, a great, you know, whatever the case may be, it, you know, those are the legacy we leave. So true. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Sr., please go to ctsmusic.com. Uh, look for his band on, uh, you're on YouTube and Rumble and all those places. Yeah, uh, phenomenal. Choose. Yeah. Uh, great music, great concerts. Uh, I've seen these guys play. They're, they're tight. They're incredible to watch and listen to. Uh, reach out to them. Jeff, thank you for being on. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. The time. You're welcome. Hey, everybody. Tune in next week. Uh, we always have a great lineup here at uh, Awakened Nation, and we're in the middle of season five. Got some really exciting guests, so please stay tuned and like us on Instagram, Rumble. Please subscribe, YouTube, as well as Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. This is a song we wrote. It's about living every day, every day with the love and kindness that God put in our hearts. If all seven billion of us in this world would do one act of kindness per day, we could change this world dramatically. Don't you agree? I've got one life that I've been given, 
Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.